Open your Bibles, if you would, to Psalms 1. Psalm 1. The title of today's message is, Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is a message about the Word of God. I love Scripture. I have found my home here at Nehalem Valley Bible Church because we love Scripture. It is our comfort. It is our hope. It is our assurance when the world is in flames around us. And that's not a hope based on circumstance. That is a hope based on experience, the use of our intellect. We delight in God's Word, and we've seen its veracity, the truth of it, borne out time and time again. And it talks about the character of God and His goodness and His righteousness and His love for those made in his image, his plan of salvation. It is my joy to bring a message about the word of God today. And Psalm 1 echoes that joy. In verses 1 through 3, it talks about the blessings upon those that delight in the word of the Lord. It says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Look at what is available to the one who delights in the word of the Lord. No matter the heat, no matter the east wind, no matter the season, it does not wither. It always prospers. Now, there's a place in Israel called En Gedi down by the deepest part of the earth. You know, the dead, dead Sea has this great big depression in the earth. Nothing grows there. And yet, if you go by En Gedi, there's a tiny little rivulet of water that drains out from the cliffside. And you can see trees that David saw that didn't wither in the 100, 100 plus degree heat when the east wind would beat upon them. They're always green. They're always lush. They're always alive. The man who puts in deep roots into the word of the Lord is like that tree. It's always green. It's always alive. It does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. This is contrasted with the wicked man who perishes. It says verse 4, the wicked are not so. But they are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. If we delight in the word of the Lord, we will flourish. We will be blessed. That involves several steps, and this is the main point of today's message. It has to be received. We have to hear it. We have to regard it in our hearts. Pay attention to what it says. And we have to respond to it. We must be receiving, regarding, and responding to the word of the Lord. And I think that that's going to show up in this message as the Lord repeats that refrain as we go on to Mark chapter 4. But before we open up to Mark 4, let's turn this time over to the Lord and ask his blessing as we open his word. Oh Lord, you know how, how grateful we are 
to have your word. Written in our heart language, we can understand your mind and your desires for us, your love, your character. Oh, Lord, we put all of our hope in you because of what your word says. Holy Spirit, we know that this word that you have authored is a sharp sword. And it pokes us right where we need to be poked. It's like a fire. It's like a hammer. And it always does what you intended to do. So, Abba, as we look at your word today, I pray that our regard for the words of Christ would increase, that our response to his word would bear much fruit, and that our lives as a reflection of what Christ have, has done for us would flourish. Oh, may it be that we would bear fruit. We dedicate this to you, Lord. It is yours. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Just briefly, uh, so you get a kind of a sense of Mark, the gospel of Mark. Uh, it's the shortest of the synoptic gospel accounts. And in it, Mark is creating a tension, a tension between what is revealed and what is hidden and only seen by faith. Uh, Mark is a tremendous gospel. But if, if you go to the last pages of Mark, and you don't have to flip there, I'm just going to describe it to you. Mark leaves off his text, not the one in parentheses that you see at the end. It's a pendant that was written after the gospel of Mark. Mark leaves his test, text off after the resurrection of Christ with everybody wondering, did this really happen? There's a tension between what is seen and what is obscured in Mark. And we see this in this parable. Jesus relays a parable to the people that are following him, to those that are listening to him, but only those that seek for the meaning find it out. And he gladly gives it. We get the benefit of their question and his answer. We'll join the text in chapter 4. Our first point of three, we have three points. The first point is titled His Parable. So if you're making an outline, there's only three points. His Parable is the title, verses one through nine. And he, Christ, began to teach again by the sea. And such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And it happened that as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road and the birds came and ate it up. And other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun rose, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they were yielding a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That last phrase is a command. Hear. Listen. What's interesting, as we're going to find out in the following verses, is not many heard. Not many inquired. They took from Jesus the parable, the story, the illustration of an agrarian event that they understood. A man broadcasting wheat seeds, wheat kernels, on soil. And they took it just as a story. Wow, that guy is such a great speaker. He really knows how to draw a crowd. And then they left. 
the story that they heard was just a parable. A parable is simply that which is a story or a saying that illustrates a truth. They didn't stick around for the truth. They just wanted the story. There's a danger here. And in just hearing the surface level, there's a danger in, in not inquiring. Jesus, what do you mean? That presupposes a level of engagement with the text. It's time to be honest. Are we like that? Do we just hear Jesus' words and go, yeah, Jesus, good. I like Jesus. But not regard what he says or respond to it. It's worth asking. Because that's where the division lies between those that follow Christ and those that just heard a nice story. Are we like that? I, I pray that within this Bible church, we are not like that. I pray that we are like the Bereans that pull apart what is taught and compare it with Scripture. See, is it true? This isn't Bible story time. This is truth time. We have a little bit of time. So I'll mention one other observation. In verse 8, look at what the seed that is sown in the good soil does. It yields a crop. The wheat seed grew a crop of wheat, didn't it? It didn't grow papayas. It didn't grow kumquats. It didn't grow mushrooms. The truth, when it takes root in our heart, yields fruit in like kind. You will be able to test and see with your own eyes, as will others looking at you, whether or not the root, root or the truth has germinated within you and borne fruit. Can you see fruit in your life? Does kind bear like kind? It did in the beginning. When the Lord made the earth, he created plants that yielded seed after their kind. Are you taking the seed that God has sown and spreading it and seeing fruit? I hope so. I really, truly hope so. In verses 10 through 12, we have our second point, their question. That is the title of the second point, their question. Verse 10 says, And when he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. Jesus, what's this story about? What do you mean? Yeah, I can see people sowing seed. I understand that. What does it mean? And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, everything comes in parables so that while seeing, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand lest they return and be forgiven. It's a quote out of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, after seeing the thrice holy God, is sent out by God to warn the people of Israel about the coming judgment. And when Isaiah asks, how long should I do this? The Lord says, until judgment falls onto these cities. But the message is not going to be heard. And Jesus quotes that. He quotes it about those who are going to be judged. Can we see and not perceive? Can we hear and not understand? Does that happen? You bet. Churches around the world are full of people that are self-deceived. That is a tremendous fear of mine, that we have folks in the chairs Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, nodding, Jesus good, I love Jesus, but totally disregarded 
not understood, not forgiven. It is paramount, friends. It is paramount that you receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Let's go back to verse 10. What did the followers, along with the 12, do? They asked him about the parable. Here's a truth that should prod us on as we spend time in God's word. Scripture will not reveal its marvels to the lazy or illiterate. Not illiterate, alliterate. What's alliteracy? It's those that can read but rebel against it and reject it. Those that are lazy, those that will read it but set it to the side, they can never expect to enjoy the delights, the blessings, the marvels of Scripture. What do you think we're going to be doing in eternity, Christian? We're going to be looking at the marvelous one who authored this. We are going to delight in him. Aeon after aeon after aeon. Will we not delight in him now? Will we not pour ourselves into this text and see what he has? Oh, there is refreshment here. There is peace. There is joy. Oh, to think that we set that aside to starve ourselves for the entertainment and the, the things that just crowd it out, that create anxiety within us and do not stabilize us. No, friends. <laughs> Dig in, feast upon the word of the Lord. Marvels, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, marvels are revealed to those who love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Do you love his word? Pour into it. You will see astonishing things. Astonishing things that make clear the world around you. Let's continue with our third point, verses 13 through 20. He's already told them the parable. The followers, along with the twelve, have asked him about the parable. He said how blessed they were because they're going to receive understanding and how unforgiven those are that will not hear and understand. Now he's going to explain the parable. This explanation is profound. It explains what we see around us. Have you ever wondered why people who profess faith in the Lord fall away? Maybe they go to a Billy Graham crusade and they stand and they march down the aisle and they say, yes, Jesus, Jesus, good. I love Jesus. And a year later, they're the back of the same old vices. They do not know the Lord. They do not serve him. He's not their savior. What? How can this be? Are they saved? Are they not this explanation describes perfectly what we see around us. It describes the ex -vangicals. It describes the deconstructionists. Pay close attention to his explanation, verses 13 through 20. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? This is important. This is a, a foundational parable. The sower sows the word. The seed is the word of God. That's what is being scattered, broadcast by the sower. It's going here. It's going there. Verse 15, and these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. Immediately. 
They hear the truth. Satan snatches it away. He's like the birds that ate up the truth. Immediately. Verse 16. And in a similar way, these are the ones being sown on the rocky places. Those who, when hearing the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. Three times the word is unfruitful in the life of these people who have heard it. Immediately, immediately, immediately. Satan snatches it. They receive it with joy, but are temporary, and then they fall away. Do we see immediate responses to the word of God? Yeah, we do. In evangelism, I hear people say, that's great. That's what I need to hear. And they turn around and they set it to the side. Have you experienced that? I knew it, Rhea. And Heidi, I, I know you're nodding internally. You know this. They hear the good word, and Satan snatches it away. Or they fall away because things get hard. There's a difference, though, between those that immediately fail and those that persevere. Let's continue. Verse 18. And others are those being sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word. But the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for anything else enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. We have those that immediately fall away, and those that take a little bit longer. There's never any fruit. There's never any result. There's never any response. They receive it, but they don't regard it. Maybe they regard it, but they don't respond to it. That's a dangerous place. It's unfruitful. What is it that causes it to be unfruitful? Worries of the world. Deceitfulness of riches. Desires for anything else. What is the prize? What is the good? What is the delight? God's word steers us through all those things, stabilizing us in the midst of them. Well, friend, if you're starving yourself with a daily devotion on, and on subsistence with a verse a day, you're opening yourself up to an attack. Do you know that? Do you know that the Satan who hates you is not taking breaks? He doesn't have a union schedule. He is full-time employing the resources at his disposal to tear you down, to shake you, to remove your fruitfulness. You have been given one weapon, one weapon that is promised to be effective, one weapon that Christ himself used against Satan. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. More important than your food, more important than your next breath, is the word of God. So why is it gathering dust, friends? Why is it disregarded? Are you deceived? Has your life been choked out? Can it be that 
having heard, that it will not be accepted, that it will not be responded to, with your eternity hanging in the balance, and those that love you depending on you for your leadership and your guidance and your testimony, can it be that you will not take this seriously? May God have mercy upon us. Luke 13. Let's go to Luke 13. Failure to fruit is a precursor to destruction. Failure to fruit is a precursor to destruction. Let's look at Luke 13, verse 6. It's another parable. Parable about fruit. And he was telling this parable, verse 6, A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in manure. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. There's an opportunity to respond to the word today. Maybe that opportunity will not be repeated tomorrow. Maybe next year is too much to expect. We think we're entitled to time, friends. It's not true. We have today, today to respond. What does responsiveness look like? Let's go back to Mark 4, verse 20. This is what responsiveness looks like. And those are the ones which were sown on the good soil. They who hear, they who receive the word and accept it, they regard it and are bearing fruit. They're responding to it 30, 60, and 100 fold. When we respond to the truth, it impacts manifold aspects of our lives. We know the damage that takes place when people take on a philosophy of the world. All of a sudden, their choices become really wrong. The virtue signaling alone indicates the reality that we see. We see, uh, oh, here's an example. Those that, that push the narrative of sexual deviancy and we see their minds twist as they try and legitimize and advocate for these demented philosophies. All of a sudden, chopping off body parts becomes okay. All of a sudden, Bestiality doesn't seem to be outside of the question. When we set aside truth, we can expect to be twisted. On the other hand, when we take truth and we wrap our arms around it, we can expect to be stabilized. We can expect to think clearly, God's word does that. Here's a warning, and it's worth ruminating on. It's worth writing down. Anything, anything, and anyone that separates us from God's word should be at a minimum suspect. I get that we have obligations. I understand that we have jobs. I understand that we have family. 
I understand those things. I don't discount them. But if we are reprioritizing God's word before under those things and not giving it the right due order, the worries of the world, the cares, they're going to choke it out. Anything that separates us from God's word should be seen as suspect. The snooze alarm? <laughs> Get up early or stay up late or do both. Go to sleep with God's word playing in your ears. I have headphones. I love going to sleep with the Psalms playing in my ears. I love getting up and looking at what God has for me, not just in one chapter, not just in one verse, but chapter after chapter after chapter. And throughout the day, you say, Mark, I'm not a pastor. I don't have that kind of time to devote to this. I am sure that if we looked at schedules, there's time. I'm positive that there is time. There's time for what is more important than food, more important than our next breath. If we simply understood it for the joy that it is, the power that it contains, and if we had regard for the author who indwells us and reveals its truth to us, I think we would find more time in our schedule. Do I say that to make you feel bad? No, I don't want to make anybody feel bad. Part of the job of preaching is reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to let you know that there's a filet mignon waiting for you. Put away the, the slim fast or whatever. Get in deep to what nourishes and stabilizes. This passage, Jesus is communicating the underlying truth of this parable that just looked like an interesting story on agrarian practices, on how to plant a productive field, was really a parable about the truth of receiving God's word and responding to it. You might be asking that, what does it look like when I am responding to it? Have you ever wondered that? Some of us have been through this cover to cover many, 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 many times. What does it look like when we're responding to it, when it's bearing fruit in our lives? What does that look like? Is there any objective metric that we can analyze that against? What does it look like to bear fruit? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1 in conclusion. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we see what we saw in the parable, increasing fruitfulness. It's not a one-off. It's not a, oh, I had a good day and I did godly things. We see a repetition, a perseverance, an increase. One wheat seed does not yield one wheat seed kernel. It yields a massive amount, a hyperabundance, 30, 60, and 100 fold. It increases, and that increase increases. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, this is the increase that you should be seeing over your life. Take a point in time in your life and analyze, am I more like this than I was then. Okay, then maybe there's some fruit in your life. Let's look. Now, for this very reason, also, applying all diligence, so really pay attention to doing this, in your faith, supply moral excellence, in your believing, respond with increased aptitude for things that are good. In your moral excellence, knowledge. If you are spending time in God's word, your knowledge of him should be increasing. And in your knowledge, self-control. You shouldn't be getting pushed around by your emotions, by the things that are around you, your circumstances. 
or your appetite. And in your self-control, perseverance. That's that striving and engaging and continuing in this event. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. Are you sweeter today than you were a year ago? I hope so. We could use a lot more of that in the world. Are you more kind to your brothers in Christ than you were a year ago? And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know him. You're responding to him. You've taken his word. You've responded to it because you believe in it. His Holy Spirit's at work in you. Do you want an objective proof that you are saved? You're looking at God's word and responding to it and bearing fruit. For in whom, verse 9, in whom these things are not present, that one is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure. For in doing these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Do you struggle with assurance, with security? Don't necessarily look to yourself. Look to the one who authored this book, the one who's in you. But if you have believed, there will be fruit. If there is no reality, there will be no fruit. Is there fruit in your life? Is there more fruit than in 2017? What were you doing in 2017? What were you doing in 2010? Some of you were just being born. For those of us that are a little bit older, what were you doing in 1990? Are you different than you were then? Can you chalk it up to just increased maturity? Or can you actually give God the credit, the glory, for him bringing about a change in your life? I hope that God is getting glory as he changes your life from the inside out. He's worthy of it to think that he would send us this letter written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors, proved time and again through historical evidence, fulfilled prophecy, to think that he would entrust this word to us. Not that we would sit on it, but that we would be like the sower who goes out into the world and broadcasts it, letting it fall where it may. I mean, for the good soil, of course, but not worried about those that are on the outside that are blind. Leave that up to the Lord. He's got it well in hand. But be about sharing his word. Let's stand and I'll close in prayer. Father God, we love your word. We have seen that it is inerrant, infallible. Oh, it is where all of our hope and joy spring from, learning about you from it. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would make us able swords, swordsmen, those that know how to accurately and rightly divide your word, I pray that you would use it in our lives daily, bringing us to repentance for the things that grieve you and bringing us to an agreement and a wholehearted agreement that, that what you say is good and right. Please change our desires. Please change our heart so that we will respond to you. 
for your glory, Lord, not for ours. We're, we are nothing, but you are everything and worthy. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.